John chapter 5, verses 1 through 4. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. So after this, or metatauta in the Greek, it's used seven times in the Gospel of John, also used nine times in the book of Revelation, same author. Uh, Bethesda is the house of mercy. The sheep gate mentioned here was probably the sheep gate from Nehemiah chapter 3 verse 1. There are ten gates. The last is called judgment. Um, the Bethesda pool was a large rectangular pool for cleaning animals. It was about 2 to 3 feet deep and about 20 to 30 feet across. Uh, five porches. Five seems to be the number of grace or mercy in the Bible. <clears throat> Benjamin's mess or food is five times as much as the others in uh, Genesis 43 verse 34. He also received five pieces of raiment in Genesis 45 verse 42, or excuse me, uh, Genesis 45 verse 22. Uh, multiples of five occur in the tabernacle. Jesus gives five loaves to the hungry. The fifth clause of the Lord's prayer is for the daily bread, etc. And so uh, verse four seems to be an explanatory addition here. There were usually about 300 people lying around this pool, probably around 2,000 around the feast time. Uh, there is zero evidence of an angel ever being involved in miraculous healings. First uh, John chapter 5, verse 19 says, The whole world lieth in the wicked one. And so, <clears throat> we don't know what feast this was during this time, but it's probably one of the major three feasts in which attendance was required. Uh, so there's a debate that centers on this uh, was either Passover, Pentecost, or Purim. Uh, if it was a Passover, then we can date four Passovers in Jesus' ministry, and we know it lasted about three and a half years. And this pool has been excavated in the area just north of the temple area and found to have had five porches, just like John said. And so the expression here, um, the expression there is, has been thought to import that St. John wrote his gospel before the destruction of Jerusalem. Um, he might have spoken in the present without meaning to be literally accurate with regard to the moment when he was writing. And so there's a Crusader-era church near the remains of this pool that they, the Crusaders, regarded this pool as that mentioned here is shown by their having represented on the wall of the crypt the angel troubling the water. And so <clears throat> many sick and injured people gathered at this pool in hope of healing. Perhaps this hope of healing was real and God honored a release of faith, or it may be that this was just a hopeful legend, which is more likely the case. Nevertheless, a great multitude of sick people believed it. It was like superstitious belief. And so the words from waiting for the water, uh, for the moving of the water through was made well of whatever disease he had are not in several old manuscripts. Nevertheless, the truth of the perception of a healing received by being first in the water is also demonstrated in the words of John chapter 5 verse 7. And so at a certain time, so people will believe that this certain time was feast time, perhaps specifically Passover, and the idea is that the people gathered around this pool in expectation of healing at the Passover season or the other feast seasons. Uh, if there were people genuinely healed by the waters of the pool of Beth uh, Bethesda, it was one of the many unusual occasions of healing in the Bible. <clears throat> and so in 2 Kings chapter 4 verses 38 through 41, some were healed by a purified pot of stew. Naaman was healed by washing in the Jordan River in 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 10-14. through 14. One was healed by touching the bones of Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Some were healed when the shadow of Peter fell upon them in Acts chapter 5, verses 14-16. through 16. And some were healed when Paul's handkerchiefs were laid upon them in Acts 19, verses 11 and 12. So God can and does things in unexpected ways. But something isn't necessarily from God simply because it's unexpected or unusual. Verses 5 and 6. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? So this man suffered from a paralytic condition for a long time and apparently was frequently at the pool of Bethesda in uh, hope of healing. And it was a hope that had been long disappointed for 38 years. So for some reason, Jesus selected this man among the great multitude of sick people. In verse 3, uh, 
out of all these people, this is the guy he went after. And Jesus, is, Jesus was not about to conduct a healing crusade at the pool of Bethesda, but he was about to miraculously meet this one man's need. And so there was a multitude of needy people there, yet none of them were looking to Jesus. And some were waiting for a more convenient season or for dreams and visions or waiting for signs and wonders or they were waiting to be compelled or revival or they were, waking, they were waiting for particular feelings. Uh, some of them were thought they were waiting for a celebrity. And so he asked them, do you want to be made well? And this is a sincere question. Jesus knew that not every sick person wants to be healed and that some are so discouraged that they put away all hope of ever being healed. Uh, and so Jesus dealt with a man who may have had his heart withered as well as his legs. So Jesus therefore attempted to build faith of this man. And it's possible that Jesus asked this even as the waters were stirred and people started jumping and diving and rolling in these waters, each hoping for some sort of evidence that they were the favored one. And so the man Jesus spoke with knew that he was not one of the favored and had no real hope to be healed. Verses 7 through 9. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed, and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. So the crippled man assumed Jesus knew how things worked at the pool of Bethesda, and he explained to Jesus why it wasn't possible for him to be healed. Quite naturally, the man couldn't think of any other way for his need to be met. And this man is an interesting case of hope combined with hopelessness. He had hope or would have never have just came to this pool of Bethesda, yet once he was there, he had very little hope to be the favored one to win the healing that day because everybody else would uh, jump in ahead of him. And so Jesus told the man to do what he could not do. Being paralyzed, it's impossible for him to just rise and take up his bed mat and walk. At this moment, Jesus challenged the man to believe him for the impossible. The bed is not a full frame to bed as we think of it, but like a bed mat. Uh, the ancient Greek word translated bed, uh, it's Macedonian in origin, and it denotes a camp bed, like a pallet. And so it's easy to imagine that the man's first reaction is, I can't do that, why even try? Yet something wonderful prompted the man to say, if this man tells me to do it, I'm going to try. So Jesus guided the man towards a response of faith. And so this, uh, he, he was immediately made well, and this happened as the man responded in faith and did exactly what Jesus told him to do. And though a moment before this, it was impossible to do it. And so the fact of this healing was confirmed in that he had the strength to carry his own bed mat and walk along with it. And so this shows us that the New Testament describes many different ways that people may be healed. The elders of the church may anoint someone with oil and pray for them, and they may be healed. And that's James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. God's people can lay hands on each other in prayer, ask God for healing, and people may be healed in Mark 16, verses 17 and 18. Uh, God may grant someone a gift of healing, either that they are directly healed or have the power to bring healing to another. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 9. God may grant healing in response to the faith of the person who desires to be healed. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 22, God may grant healing in response to the faith of another on behalf of the person who is healed. In Mark chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and Matthew chapter 8, verse 13, and God can also heal through medical treatment. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, James chapter 5, verse 14, and Luke chapter 10, verse 34. So that all this was done on the Sabbath day is going to be the source of controversy that follows. Verse 10 through 13. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. So throughout his gospel, John uses the term the Jews in the sense of the Jewish leaders, not all of the Jews in Jerusalem. And so carrying a bed is actually a sleeping mat or a bedroll was in fact a violation of the rabbi's interpretation of the commandment against doing work or business on the Sabbath. It's not breaking of the God's law of the Sabbath, but the human interpretation of God's law. And so the devotion to the rabbi's interpretation of the Sabbath law continues in modern times. An example is found in April 1992 uh, when tenants let three apartments in an Orthodox neighborhood in Israel burn to the ground 
while they asked a rabbi whether a telephone call to the fire department on the Sabbath would violate the Jewish law. Observant Jews are forbidden to use the phone on the Sabbath because doing so would break an electrical current, which is considered a form of work. And so in the half hour it took the rabbi to decide yes, the fire spread to two neighboring apartments. And so the Jewish leaders didn't want to know who healed the crippled man. They wanted to know who told him to carry a bed mat on the Sabbath day. And so to the religious leaders, Jesus was the man who broke the Sabbath. To the healed man, Jesus was he who made me well. And so Jesus did not want to remain with the commotion surrounding the man's healing because he did not intend to heal the entire multitude. It was better for him to withdraw. Verse 14 and 15. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. So Jesus found him because he was concerned for his spiritual health. He said, Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. It's not only his physical health. Living a life of sin is worse and will bring a worse result than being crippled for 38 years. We need to think about the weight of that. And so the fact that he reported Jesus to the authority shows how intimidated the man was by those same religious leaders. Verse 16 through 18. For this reason the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him, because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. So remarkably, the healing seemed to make no difference to those who persecuted Jesus. All they could see was that their religious rule was broken, a rule that went beyond the command of Scripture itself. And so the absolute devotion to the traditions of man surrounding the Sabbath can't be understated. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 23 verses 12 through 14 tells Israel to practice good sanitation when their armies are camped. And so ancient rabbis applied the same principle to the city of Jerusalem, which they regarded as the camp of the Lord. When this was combined with Sabbath travel restrictions, it resulted in a prohibition against going to the bathroom on the Sabbath. And so the anger and hatred of the religious leaders is difficult to explain, apart from seeing that it had a spiritual root. They did not like Jesus, and therefore they did not like God the Father. And so Jesus did not try and explain that he had not truly worked on the Sabbath. Instead, he boldly explained to the religious leaders that his father worked on the Sabbath, and therefore Jesus the Son also worked on the Sabbath. So God never stops working. The Sabbath, the day of rest, was meant for man. Uh, And so in some some ways it's strange that the God of the Bible is a working God. And in the old world, it's hardly an honorable thing to work. It was... um, It was something for slaves and strangers, not of freeborn men. Hence, work and greatness rarely went together, and nothing could be more alien to the genius of paganism than a toiling god. And so, though he rested from creating, he never ceased from uh, preserving and governing that which you know that which he formed. And so, in this respect, he can keep no Sabbaths, for nothing can continue to exist or answer the end proposed by the divine wisdom and goodness without the, the continual energy of God. And so, this is going to answer the objection raised by a hostile and ignorant critic of Christianity. Um, I saw this statement written in an anti-Christian tract, you know, just say no to a God who claims to be all-powerful and then requires a nap after only six days of creating This objection betrays the lack of understanding on behalf of the writer. The Bible clearly says that God does not need sleep nor rest in Psalm 121 verses 3 and 4, right, where it says, He who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The rest of God on the seventh day was given for man's benefit, not God's, demonstrating a pattern of rest that's necessary for man's well-being. And so the religious leaders did not miss the fact that Jesus claimed to be equal with God. They knew clearly that when Jesus said that God was his father in this unique way, that he declared himself equal with God. Right? They understood that. Verse 19 and 20. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son, and shows him all things that he himself does, and he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. And so, in this extended discussion, 
Jesus explained to the religious leaders some of the nature of his relationship and work with God the Father. Because of this, we have a lot of information of the relationship between uh, God the Father and God the Son. So Jesus explained that he, as God the Son, does nothing independently. He was and is fully submitted to the Father's will. This submission comes by choice, not by coercion or by an inferior nature. So Jesus explained that his work was a perfect reflection of the work and will of God the Father. Jesus is, sh Jesus is showing us exactly what the work and will of God is. And so some people think of a great difference or even a small difference between God the Father and God the Son as if the God the Father emphasized judgment and God the Son emphasized love. Sometimes they think the same way over what they call the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. Uh, they're one and the same. This thinking is wrong. It usually comes from refusing to, dis, uh, to see the obvious displays of love in God the Father or the display of the righteousness in God the Son, right? The book of Revelation and the flipping of the money changers tables. <clears throat> and so the relationship between the first and second members of the Trinity is not one of master and slave, not of employer and employee, but of father and son, which are united by love. And so that the Father loves the Son has been affirmed already in the Gospel in chapter 3, verse 35. It is immaterial that the verb here is phileo, whereas the earlier occurrence is agapo, or agape. So the religious leaders were stunned by what Jesus told the formerly paralyzed man to do. Jesus told him that they, were, uh, that they would see even greater works, ones that would make them marvel. Verse 21 through 23. For as the Father raised the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. For the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son, that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. So Jesus used the work of resurrection as an example of the shared work of the Father and the Son. Here the Son has the power and the authority to raise the dead and give life to them just as the Father does. And so in this, Jesus appealed to the ultimate power. It's hard to think of a greater power and authority than that to raise the dead. The, relig the religious leaders didn't want to think much about Jesus' ability to heal, to heal this uh, paralytic. And so they focused him um, as a uh, Sabbath breaker. And so yet the power of Jesus went far beyond the power to just heal. And so Jesus used the work of judgment as an example of division of labor between the Father and the Son. It's before God the Son that people will stand on the day of judgment. Even during his earthly ministry, Jesus was something of a judge among humanity. And so just being in the presence of Jesus led one to know, I'm not like him. Jesus looked at the rich young ruler and he was judged. He looked upon Simon Peter and he was judged. There were not looks of anger. Uh, they were looks of love, and yet when they saw the face of Jesus, they knew a love was extended to them that they were not worthy of. And so God the Father gave this work of judgment to God the Son so that people would honor Jesus as they should, and that they should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Failing to honor God the Son means that it's impossible for one to also honor God the Father who sent the Son. And this is a clear claim to deity. If Jesus, designating himself as the Son here, was not God, then it would be idolatry to honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Verse 24 through 27. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. So Jesus explained to the astonished religious leaders that those who heard his word should have uh, everlasting life, that they would have the life connected with eternity and have that life right now. So John chapter 3, verse 16 stated that belief in Jesus in the sense of trusting and relying on and clinging to was the path to everlasting life. Here, Jesus said that hearing his word and belief in the Father is the path to everlasting life. Because the Father and the Son are so united in their work, each is true of the other. And so true belief in the Father is belief in the Son, and true belief in the Son is belief in the Father. Get my, get my drift? And so this is one aspect here, shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. That's an aspect that it is 
uh, essential to everlasting life, to escape judgment for sin and to pass from the position of death to the position of life. And so basically he's saying is like has changed his country or place of abode. Death is the country where every Christless soul lives. The man who knows not God gives a dying life or a living death. But he who believes in the Son of God passes over from the empire of death to the empire of life. And so Jesus had already explained that one who lives can hear his word, believe, and have everlasting life. Now he adds that one day even the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and be raised again. These are remarkable claims to be much more than just a man. And so Jesus further described his uniqueness to the religious leaders by claiming that he, is, uh, he has life in himself, a gift granted by God the Father. Um, Jesus had life in himself, not dependent upon other people or things. None of us has life inherent in ourselves. Our life is derived from our parents and the fragile environment around us. Jesus claimed that his life was derived from no one. It is inherent and uncreated, and God alone possesses it. And so as Jesus explained his nature and deity to the religious leaders in this chapter, it's evident that he did not claim identity with the Father as one person, but asserted his equality to God the Father and his relationship of love with the Father. So Jesus and the Father are not the same, but they are equal, just like John chapter 1 verse 1 states. All right, verse 28 through 30. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. So previously, Jesus said that all who have everlasting life would hear his voice and live. In verse 25, he now extended the concept of resurrection to all of humanity, both those who have done good and those who have done evil. This does not mean that salvation is on the basis of good works, for this very gospel makes it plain over and over again that man enter, um, men will enter eternal life when they believe on Jesus Christ, but the lives they live form the test of the faith they profess. And so Jesus explained this to the astonished uh, religious leaders to explain who he was, the resurrection of life, the resurrection of condemnation, um, the nature of his authority and deity here. And so at the same time, it tells us something remarkable about humanity, that everyone, both those good and bad, uh, will live forever, far beyond the physical and material life that they know on this earth in this age. Jesus will command them to rise on that day in bodies that are suited for eternity. And so Jesus explained that he is qualified as a completely righteous judge because his power is in submission to God the Father. And he repeated the themes, I can do nothing to myself, I do not seek my own will, but the, Father, the will of the Father who sent me. Verse 31 and 32. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. So like anyone else, it's not enough for Jesus to simply claim things about himself. There had to be an outside and independent witness to his true identity and nature. And this principle is established by Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15, which says, By the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. Jesus explained to the religious leaders that he was God, but his testimony alone was not enough. So in the following passage, Jesus brought forth three trustworthy witnesses who will testify that he is equal to the Father. Jesus found it important to give them reason to believe beyond what he has said about himself. Verse 33 through 35. You have sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Yet I do not receive testimony from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. He, w he was the burning and shining lamp, and you were willing for a time to rejoice in his light. So Jesus noted that the religious leaders knew and heard of John the Baptist for themselves, and they needed to think of and believe what John said about Jesus. And so the religious leaders accepted the work of John the Baptist for a time. They needed to continue to believe John regarding Jesus the Messiah. Verse 36, But I have a greater witness than John's. For the works which the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father has sent me. So Jesus claimed another witness regarding his identity and deity, the very works that he did. This present controversy started with a remarkable healing of a man that was paralyzed for 38 years, and this was one of the many works that testified to the deity of Jesus. 
And so the majority of the miraculous works of Jesus were simple acts of compassion and mercy done for simple and needy people. In this, these works bear witness to the heart of God. The Jews looked for a miraculous Messiah, but they did not look for one who would express his miraculous power in simple acts of compassion and mercy. They looked for the Messiah to use miraculous power to bring military and political deliverance to Israel. And so because these works that he was doing didn't fit in with what they thought the Messiah would do, they didn't receive this witness of Jesus' works. Verse 37 and 38. And the Father himself who sent me he has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. But you do not have his word abiding in you, because whom he sent, him you do not believe. So in virtually every work and word of Jesus, God the Father testified to Jesus' status as the Son of God. But specifically, the Father testified of the Son in the Old Testament prophecy and at the baptism of Jesus in Luke chapter 3 verse 22. So they will not receive the testimony of the Father because they do not have his word abiding in them. They can't hear God the Father audibly or see him, but they have his word. They're guilty because they do not abide in the word that God gave them. Verse 39, you search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and these are they which testify of me. So in theory, the religious leaders in Jesus' day loved and they valued the scriptures, here used in the sense of the Old Testament or the Septuagint. And so they studied and memorized and thought upon them continually, correctly thinking eternal life was found in God's revelation. Um, but they read it not to search for God, but to find arguments to support their own positions. They didn't really love God, they just loved their own ideas about God. And so if their study of the scriptures was accurate and sincere, then they would see that they spoke of the Messiah, God the Son. Their recognition of and belief upon Jesus was the measure of their true understanding of the scriptures. Verse 40 through 44. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes only you know, from God? <clears throat> and uh, the religious leaders were not willing, even though they all had the testimony one could have wanted. They were concerned with man's honor and not the honor that comes from God. And so Jesus makes it clear that having life is found in fulfilling the command, come to me. And so their refusal to come to Jesus was despite their searching of the scriptures. In John chapter 5, verse 39, uh, They search the scriptures, but they will not come to Jesus. It is not therefore a good thing, uh, you know, is it not therefore a good thing to search the scriptures? Uh, it is, and the more you search them, the better. But still, it is not the thing. It is not the saving work. You may be Bible readers and yet perish, but this can never happen if you come to Jesus by faith. Okay? And so the reasons for the rejection were fundamentally reasons of the heart and not the mind. These religious leaders could hide behind supposedly intellectual excuses, but their real lack was love and desire for the honor that comes from God. And Jesus prophesied the coming day when the descendants of those religious leaders would embrace a false Christ, an antichrist, who comes in his own name. That's what he's pointing to here. The rejection of Jesus left them open to terrible deception. And the words are perhaps spoken primarily of the false or idol Messiah, the Antichrist, or the Pseudo-Christ, who shall appear in the latter days from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 8-12, through 12, whose appearance shall be according to the working of Satan, their father, in John chapter 8, verse 44, showing himself that he is God, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. And so the fatal error of the religious leaders of Jesus' day and ever since is pride. They longed for prestige and honor from one another and were willing to sacrifice the honor that comes from God alone for the sake of man's honor. And so there are some ways how fame, honor, and celebrity will hinder true faith. Um, you know, the mere fact of receiving honor, even if that honor is rightly rendered, may make faith in Christ a difficulty. When a man gets to feel that he ought to be honored, he's in extreme danger. Always receiving this undeserved honor, they deceive themselves into believing that they deserved it. And so, dear friends, it's very difficult to receive honor and to expect it, and yet to keep your eyesight. For men's eyes gradually grow dull through the smoke of the incense which is burned before them. Verse 45-47 
Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you trust. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So these religious leaders rejected Jesus because they rejected God's word through Moses. Moses accused them because Moses wrote about Jesus and they would not receive the testimony of Moses. Jesus said that the scriptures that they testify of me in John chapter 5 verse 39. The words and writings of Moses fulfilled this prophetically speaking of the Messiah in many places. In Deuteronomy 18 at verse 15 it says the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst from your brethren him you shall hear. Numbers 21 verses 8 and 9 will say then the Lord said to Moses make a fiery serpent set it on a pole and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and so it was if the serpent had bitten anyone when he looked at the bronze serpent he lived. And Jesus was typified in the rock that gave Israel water in the wilderness in Numbers chapter 20 verses 8 through 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4. The ministry of Jesus was shown in almost every aspect of the seven different kinds of offering that God commanded Israel to bring in Leviticus chapter 1 through 7. Jesus and his ministry were shown in the tabernacle in its service. One place where the New Testament makes this connection is with the word propitiation in Romans chapter 3 verse 25, which speaks of the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. The law of the bondservant also speaks of Jesus from Exodus 21 verses 5 and 6 and Psalm 40 verses 6 through 8. No wonder Jesus could say, Behold, I come in the scroll of the book it is written of me in Psalm 40 verse 7. He could teach a Bible study where, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, from Luke chapter 24, verse 27. Thus the writings of Moses were prophetic. In them nothing was completed. They pointed to other things, which came to pass when Jesus came. And so Jesus did not call these religious leaders to a new or a different faith. He called them to believe what Moses, what the scriptures, what his works, what John the Baptist each testified about Jesus, that he is the Messiah, Shiloh, the Son of God, and God the Son. If they refused to believe this overwhelming testimony, it is unlikely that they would believe Jesus' own words.